it's still in presenter view. Yeah, I'll add display settings. That should be better. Yeah, you're perfect. Okay. All right. All right, you can see my slides now? Yes, I can. Okay, so good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, Jeff, for the introduction and for the opportunity to work uh, today. Um, like Jeff said, my name is Yemi Fada Hunsi. Um, uh, I've been here almost nine months now, so it's been, it's been a while. And I'm excited to present to you this morning. So I'm talking to you about uh, premature ventricular uh, complexes. Um, so partly because one, I have a special interest in, in this, and also, um, partly because uh, patients with uh, PVCs are sometimes relegated to the background uh, in, uh, for more um, other rhythm problems like atrial fibrillation and SVTs. And this occurs for a number of reasons, uh, one of which is uh, the atypical symptoms they sometimes present with that uh, make, may make, the, uh, make uh, describing an association between the PVCs and their symptoms, uh, making that connection. We, um, uh, I can I like so, uh, the way I approach PVCs and some of the uh, initial work up we do. So I have no disclosures for this talk. And I have three, three main objectives. So one is to pr provide you a template for initial evaluation. Uh, second, um, outline uh, indications for uh, treating uh, PVCs. And thirdly, highlighting um, uh, options for management of PVCs. So I have two cases I would like to share with you. Uh, the first is a 71-year-old female who uh, had seen an inpatient service uh, as a transfer who had presented with palpitations, atypical chest pain, and fatigue. Um, Alter monitor had shown uh, a sign, predominant sinus rhythm with a 10% PVC uh, burden. Uh, she had no cardiac history, uh, had the usual cardiac risk factors. Uh, on an exercise uh, nuclear stress test, um, she did reasonably well with functional class 1 status with no ischemia and had more frequent uh, PVCs uh, on the stress. And a transthoracic echocardiogram showed a structurally normal uh, heart. Uh, this is what our ECG looks like, uh, showing PVCs in a bigeminy uh, pattern. Um, you know, looking at this, the right bundle branch block, positive concordance, inferior access. It tells us it's coming from somewhere close to the mitral uh, annular origin. And she had tried beta blockers and flecainide. And of course, the question, uh, for us, when I received a call from the referring doc was, you know, what should we do, you know? So the options there, do nothing, add a calcium channel blocker, try amiodarone, or consider for an ablation. And the second case is uh, a 70-year-old gentleman who uh, was found to have incidental PVCs on routine checkup. He had absolutely no symptoms. On a stress test, he had, uh, was able to exercise for 11 minutes, uh, no concerns for ischemia. Um, echo was uh, structural, showed a structurally normal heart. The altar monitor showed a very high PVC burden at 32%, uh, was started on verapamil by the referring physician, and a uh, repeat altar monitor uh, showed the PVC burden you know, reduced only marginally to about 24%. Uh, this is, I don't have his exact PVCs, but uh, they do uh, look like this coming from the RVOT, so left bundle. Uh, sort of a V4 transition and inferior access uh, consistent with an RVOT, so RV outlet uh, PVC. So we'll come back to these uh, cases. Again, similar options to the first case. So uh, PVCs, um, they are fairly common, but I would say in most patients, they are benign. Um, in a study looking at um, routine ECG in patients without a disease, you've uh, they found one to four percent of patients having uh, PVCs. And when you do a prolonged monitoring, uh, the frequency of PVCs increases to about 40 to 75 uh, percent. So, and then that begs the question, so it, is there a normal burden of PVC or is there a threshold that you would consider uh, to be abnormal PVC uh, burden? We don't have great studies. The few studies that have looked at it are mostly observational. And there was this particular study that looked at uh, the uh, outcomes in patients with frequent PVCs, defined as one or more PVC on an ECG or uh, greater than 30 PV PVCs an hour. To put that in context, if you do an all-time monitor, if a patient has more than 
about 30 PVCs an hour, that would translate to less than 1% PVC burden. But in this study, they found that this was associated with um, adverse uh, cardiovascular outcomes. The limitations with this study was one, it was observational, and then two, uh, there was no uh, rigorous uh, assessment done to eliminate patients with underlying uh, cardiac disease, because we do know patients who have uh, cardiomyopathy, you know, PVCs may, uh, may be a manifestation of the severity of underlying disease rather than um, associated with a poor prognosis. So here in St. John, um, you know, I, I alluded to the fact that we, you know, we did do a, a few cases of PVCs uh, ablation. So it's about last year, we did about 5% of all our EP cases uh, were uh, PVCs. Uh, you know, I, I think that could be more given uh, the prevalence of PVCs uh, around. So I guess the first question I'd like to address is, uh, when should you intervene uh, in cases uh, in patients who present with PVCs? So the critical, most important thing is the presence of symptoms. So if patients uh, have symptoms uh, that you can attribute to their PVCs, then we should do something about it. Um, most common symptoms will be palpitations, presyncope, but sometimes they also present uh, with very atypical and vague symptoms that are non-specific, like you know dyspnea, fatigue, uh, atypical chest pain, and sometimes um, you get a call. Some I don't know uh, when on, on call from the emergency department saying, "Hey, I have a patient here whose pulse is 40, but on telemetry you can see the heart rate at 80." So. Sometimes the PVCs can be non-perfusing and not generating a pulse. And then the other group of patients that we uh, also intervene upon are patients who have a cardiac resynchronization device. And if they are non-responding and they have a low BIV uh, pacing percentage, so usually less than 90%, and we think this low pacing percentage is due to PVCs, I think that's a group of patients we should also intervene upon. And then thirdly, in patients who have a PVC cardiomyopathy, is another group of patients that we should also strongly uh, intervene uh, upon. Um, just a little bit more about PVC cardiomyopathy. So uh, we do have patients who have cardiomyopathy and patients who also have PVCs that may not have anything to do with each other. As you can imagine, uh, there will be an intersection of patients who have cardiomyopathy and PVCs that may or may not be unrelated. But when we talk about PVC cardiomyopathy, we're talking about the specific group of patients who uh, develop a cardiomyopathy because of their PVC. And when you eliminate the PVC, the cardiomyopathy usually responds. So that's a smaller group of patients um, uh, that we refer to as PVC cardiomyopathy. So some of the factors that uh, would favor uh, uh, PVC cardiomyopathy, because this is a very challenging diagnosis to make, because it's kind of like the chicken and the egg situation, which one comes first. But some of the things that are in favor of a PVC cardiomyopathy uh, would include a young, otherwise healthy patient, no cardiac history. Um, it is usually, un it's unusual for PVC cardiomyopathy to cause severe LV dysfunction. So LV less than 25%, usually you'd see the range about 30s to 40s uh, percent. And on, on a cardiac MRI, uh, patients with PVC cardiomyopathy will usually have minimal to no scar. And we don't expect uh, PVCs to cause cardiomyopathy unless the PVC burden is more than 10%. And of course, uh, when you have PVCs in the usual uh, idiopathic location, like the RVOT, LVOT, papillary muscle, epicardial location, those are more likely uh, to be uh, PVC cardiomyopathy. And of course, when um, having one PVC versus multiple complexes, uh, usually uh, in favor of uh, a PVC cardiomyopathy rather than a cardiomyopathy causing uh, PVCs. And I think the most important is the response to PVC suppression. If you do eliminate the PVCs and the LV function improves, then that's what clinches the diagnosis. So when you, uh, I see a patient uh, for the first time, what are the goals of that initial evaluation? So like I mentioned earlier, the first thing is, uh, are there symptoms associated with the PVCs? knowing fully well that some of the symptoms may be atypical. Uh, they, um, and then the other thing uh, I try to assess is uh, the presence of underlying structural abnormalities, our type of multi, either uh, resulting from the PVCs or separate from, from the PVCs. Uh, particularly in patients with uh, uh, PVCs ar arising from the right ventricle, uh, you always have to have at the back of your mind, um, uh, is this an ARVC? And that's where the echo uh, comes in 
uh, to look for any structural art abnormalities. And finally, um, we also think about the risk of sudden cardiac death. So particularly in patients who may have cardiomyopathy or uh, patients uh, who uh, may also have uh, associated uh, runs of uh, either non-sustained VT or VT as part of their uh, TVC presentation. So, you know, workup is pretty standard. Again, history and physical examination, um, trying to identify symptoms that may relate to PVC. And uh, on the exam, you're looking for uh, uh, any findings that may suggest underlying uh, structural heart abnormality. So the 12-lead ECG is very important uh, for us as electrophysiologists. Um, so when you refer a patient, we, we need to see what the PVC morphology looks like on the, on the 12-lead ECG, because that gives an idea of where the PVC is coming from. And as I'll mention, I'll mention a little later, it, it gives us an idea of you know, how successful is an ablation and you know, what's the, how complex the procedure could be. And alter monitor is also very useful uh, before initiating treatment and after initiating treatment, because that uh, would give you an, uh, uh, the very, you know, would tell you if patient is having more different uh, variations of PVC or it's just one morphology gives you, allows you to estimate the response to treatment and uh, also tell, gives you information about other iris findings like, uh, you know, uh, uh, runs of ventricular arrhythmias. And uh, transthoracic echocardiogram is very crucial, um, helps you uh, and find the structural abnormalities. And a stress test I find also very useful. Uh, one, for ischemia assessment. Uh, two, uh, some patients have more symptoms uh, with, uh, with activity and that can provide that information. I, I, for cardiac MRI, I put it plus or minus. You don't need it for all patients, uh, but in some group of patients that may be useful. And again, depending on patient presentation, you may need a diagnostic cardiac catheterization or a PET, uh, particularly in cases of sarcoidosis. So the treatment options, I guess the first question that you have to ask yourself is do you need to intervene? And if the answer is yes, um, always not a bad idea to start with non-pharmacological uh, therapy. So avoiding triggers, exercise, uh, reduce caffeine. Again, granted, there's not very strong evidence that this uh, changes much, but I think it's definitely not a bad idea. And then uh, for therapy, there are two broad options, either pharmacologic or invasive with an ablation. Uh, pharmacologic, uh, starting with the beta blockers is uh, always, uh, I think, the first option. And they consider custom channel blockers if uh, there's a contraindication to beta blockers. Uh, by the time you start thinking about antiarrhythmics, um, I, I, you know, I, I would definitely be thinking about an ablation as well, given that uh, antiarrhythmics may have uh, also uh, side effects. Uh, in general, you know, class one agent, uh, flecknine and propofenol in patients without structural heart abnormalities, and uh, same as sotalol as well. And then when you have structural heart abnormalities, then you stop with uh, amiodarone. And then the success of an ablation uh, depends on the location of the PVC. So RVOT PVCs are probably uh, the one with the highest success rate in the range of 90%. And when you have PVCs coming from the LVOT or the early cops, uh, the success rate is also high in, in the 80s, 80s range. When you start getting to the papillary muscle or epicardial PVCs, then uh, success of the procedure goes down to about 60 to 70%. Uh, so the factors that will be in favor of recommending an ablation therapy would be, again, in patients who are younger, who have uh, idiopathic PVC, IPVC brought in and are quite symptomatic, or if they have failed or not tolerated pharmacologic therapy. Um, when I see 10 PVCs on a halter monitor, I, I'm not interested in doing an ablation because you know it's, each PVC probably takes you about two to three hours. So that's not a great idea to go for an ablation. And then uh, in patients who have PVC cardiomyopathy, uh, I think there's a strong indication to go for an ablation. So going back to uh, the first patient I presented, who I presented with uh, atypical symptoms of uh, fatigue, atypical chest pain, uh, I tried beta blockers and flecainide. And I think also I tried, briefly tried amiodarone and, and was discontinued. Uh, when we, we accelerated our on transfer. And at this point, you know, we had limited options uh, other than going for an, for an ablation. Our PVC burden was quite... Uh, remarkable. So um, just a little bit of what we do in, in the EP lab. Again, I know a lot of people think what we do in the EP lab uh, is a black box, including myself before I did my electrophysiology training. But there are two kinds of activation we do. So one, two, sorry, two kinds of mapping. One is the activation mapping, where we position the uh, catheter in areas of interest and wait for a PVC to happen. 
And then we compare the electrocardiogram at that point to the initial deflection of the QRS. So in this case, uh, you can see here the ablation uh, signal uh, is occurring about 30 milliseconds before the QRS complex. And that's what you're looking for, looking for about a 20 uh, milliseconds pre-QRS activation tells you you're close to the origin of the PVC. And then the other kind of mapping we do is called pace mapping, uh, which is, again, you position the character in an area of interest, and then you, you deliver a pacing complex so on the left screen here. And then you compare the morphology of the pacing complex to the uh, intrinsic uh, PVC. And ideally, you want a 12 out of 12 match uh, for, uh, for the pace complex, which tells you you're very close to the origin of the PVC. And then the mapping system also computes this and tells you how close you are and gives you a percentage of uh, uh, match. So for this particular patient, we're able to, so this is a right lateral uh, view. Uh, the yellow dot here is the HIST, so you're very close to the LVOT here. And then the mitral analysis is somewhere around uh, here. And then we're able to localize the earliest path from where the PVC was originating from to secure mitral analysis, just like we thought with the, by looking at the ECG. And given a few ablation lesions at that site, we're able to eliminate uh, this uh, PVC successfully. Uh, in four month follow up, our PVC body had reduced from 38% to 3%, and she was doing quite well uh, with improved uh, symptoms. The second patient was quite ch more challenging, uh, who uh, again was completely asymptomatic, had a 32% PVC body, and on Vera Pamil, the PVC body reduced to uh, 24%. So again, uh, coming back to what I mentioned earlier, the first question I asked myself is, do we need to intervene in this patient? There's a very high PVC burden, but the patient asked me repeatedly, like, why am I doing here? I have no symptoms, um, did remarkably well on the exercise stress test. There was no structural abnormalities on the echo. And, you know, I frankly discussed when, like, you know, if you have no symptoms, LV function is normal. There's frankly no indication to do uh, anything at this time. But there's the understanding that there's a fairly high risk for developing PVC cardiomyopathy down, down the line. But there are no studies that have shown that addressing the PVCs uh, pre-development of cardiomyopathy will um, obviate the need to, that will, will, will prevent the cardiomyopathy. So I discontinued this uh, Vera Pramil given that there was no significant improvement in the PVC body. And I plan to see him in one year with a repeat altar monitor and an echo. And uh, again, if I see any subclinical functions, uh, findings of LV dysfunction, either increase in LV size or uh, strained abnormalities, I would uh, uh, recommend going ahead with uh, an intervention in this case. So to conclude, um, PVCs are fairly common, but mostly benign. Um, we do not have a clear cutoff of what constitutes normal PVC boarding. I think the key things uh, when you evaluate patient and uh, is if there are presence of symptoms associated with the PVCs, or if they are underlying uh, structural abnormalities, either resulting from the PVCs or separate from the PVCs. And when there's a decision to intervene in this patient, there, you have two options, uh, pharmacologic with medications or ablation. And in groups of patients, uh, there are groups of patients who strongly uh, favor doing an ablation on, so younger patients, idiopathic PVCs or eye body PVCs, or in patients who have a PVC uh, cardiomyopathy. So I think that's all I had. and. Um, uh, I will be happy to take questions uh, at this time. Perfect, Yemi. Thank you very much. So if you can stop sharing your screen, then you'll you'll appear much larger for everybody. Um, so thank you for the talk. I, I wonder if you could comment on sort of things that may impact a little bit on your, when you see PVCs. I guess I, I'd come from it from my perspective when I see patients with bad heart failure or or after heart surgery, uh, in which then I see new PVCs, obviously we worry always about sick myocardium, irritability, risk of transitioning to VT and that kind of stuff. So what are your thoughts around that? Obviously different in the acute setting versus the chronic setting. Um, and uh, we're, we tend to be ultra aggressive at trying to suppress them as best we can, uh, but often it's just tre treating myself rather than truly treating the patient. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. That's a good question. Um, yeah, you definitely see different patients from what we'd see in general. So you are seeing them, you know, with cardiomyopathy, post-surgery, and the PVCs in those situations are usually uh, due to, uh, you know, um, irritability from the recent surgery, uh, from the online uh, heart disease. Um, uh, this, you know, this question was addressed, uh, you know, the CAST trials, I think from the 90s, 
where we thought, you know, if we're seeing PVCs in patients uh, post MI, maybe suppressing the PVCs will be helpful. And uh, granted, the, the, the antiarrhythmics that was used in those studies were class one uh, C agent flecainide, and, you know, they did show uh, worse, worse outcomes compared to. So in, in your group of patients with PVCs post surgery, in the absence of, you know, sustained arrhythmias, uh, I, I would frankly not intervene other than beta blockers which they will most likely need anyway. And, you know, a few months down the line, you know, when they've improved from surgery, when things are a little bit more settled, if they are still having a frequent PVCs, um, either they're symptomatic, or if you think that could be contributing to their worsening cardiomyopathy, then there might be a group of patients we might uh, uh, act upon. You know, I did talk about the PVC cardiomyopathy group. It, 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 it can happen in patients with cardiomyopathy where they are known to have cardiomyopathy with EF of 30, 35%. And then all of a sudden they have a, a increased PVC burden that may be coming from an idiopathic location and their PVC and their LV function declines further. So those patients, even though they have a cardiomyopathy separate, um, but the PVC may have worsened it. And in those group of patients, we so intervene as well. Okay. There is a question from Ron. Um, so although there is no normal PVC burden, is greater than 20% of PVC burden still a cutoff for increased risk of PVC cardiomyopathy? Yeah, absolutely right. So I, I you know, I think, you know, 20% was the number I was, I, I used to be uh, for years ago, but I think the, the trend has changed. Uh, the, the, the threshold is a little bit lower now. So 10%, so anything more than 10% increase, you know, and you know, th there's different reasons why 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 that number is not a hard fast draw. Because when you do a halter monitor, you're looking at a 24-hour snapshot of the patient. So it's possible on the, the one day you do the halter monitor, the PVC body may be a little bit on the lower side. And I find in patients when they have the monitor on, they, they alter their level of activity on that day. So it may not be a true reflection of their PVC body over the next month or so. So I think the cutoff, you know. If over 10%, there is a suggestion that that could, below 10%, we we'll say it's less likely, but I've definitely seen patients with less than 10% of the body who, who have cardiomyopathy as well. Perfect. Uh, I think there's a hand up from Sharif. Sharif, you, are, you had a question, so please go ahead. Hi, Yemi. Thank you very much for that. Um, I just wanted to follow up on that last comment. Um, what is, how often should we be monitoring these patients? So let's say you have somebody with 15% PVC burden on a Holter, um, you know, how often should they have Holters, echocardiograms? Um, does it change? I've had some people where they had high PVC burden and then the next year you do an echo, do a Holter and they have like very minimal. Um, does that change how you would approach those patients? Um, you know, because I figure that there's a lot of these patients that stay, you know, their EF stay normal. I hate to just kind of say that they need an echo every year of their life, um, you know, for those particular people. But no, absolutely, that, that's a great question. You know, it, it comes to that um, uh, variation in PVC burden on a day to day basis. You know, in the ideal world, you want to do like a seven, one week sort of daily monitoring, you know, give you more data points, but that's not always feasible. I think, you know, 24 to 48 hours is, is reasonable. And like you said, you know, in patients who have a high PVC burden over 10%, and if you decide to do nothing at that point because they're asymptomatic or they have a normal LV function, uh, you should have them on uh, yearly ultra monitor assessment and, and, and echo assessment. And you're right, uh, if in a year the PVC burden is, is reduced, you know, it, it's not a bad idea to do it one more time. And if it's still reduced, then you can say, okay, well, we can stop doing the yearly monitoring just because, you know, there's a natural variation in PVCs. Some people, either as a result of stress or change in life situation, they, they have a high PVC burden over a few weeks to months. And then usually that may suppress itself uh, over time. So. I have one more question. This will be our last question from the audience. I, I, Craig Brown is asking, uh, uh, are you more worried with couplets or sort of the appearance of the, or bursts obviously, so non-sustained rather, so rather than the percentage of, of, of VT, so, or, or sorry, of PVC? Absolutely. So um, when, when assessing the Alta monitor, it's, it's not just looking at the PVC uh, burden. We're also looking at any high risk feature. So having PVC couplets or, uh, having, uh, you know, non-sustained uh, VT runs 
uh, it, it is, it's an high risk uh, feature. Um, usually in patients with idiopathic PVCs, the, you know, I guess in some, in some phenotypes, you, you do see, you know, non-sustained VTs or VTs, uh, but it, it does raise, um, um, I guess, lowers the threshold for intervention out there. Okay. Well, on that, we are going to close. So thank you again, Yami, for doing rounds and thank you for the engagement of everybody and uh, have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.